coming up next is the Dr. Kim Taylor Show. Here's your chance to talk about what matters to you. Although you'll receive helpful advice from Dr. Kim, remember this is not to be construed as any form of psychotherapy, diagnosis or treatment, and cannot replace a therapeutic relationship with a mental health professional. You can reach Dr. Kim by calling 564-1290 or 866-564-1290. You can also listen live on the internet at drkimtaylorshow.com. Now, here's Dr. Kim. Does the advancement of technology change our ability and maybe even our desire to form and maintain meaningful relationships? What we do know is it's certainly having a profound impact on the way we communicate and the way we receive information and process that information. So there's no doubt that computers and the Internet have had a vital and transformative effect on how we relate to each other. But has it also changed the way we think and feel about ourselves? Today we'll be talking to leading expert Robert Weiss about his newest book called Closer Together, Further Apart, The Effect of Technology and the Internet on Parenting, Work, and Relationships. Since the beginning of time, every older generation has looked down upon the younger generation and questioned whether the world was coming to an end and shaking their heads at the newest trends or direction of its youth. So when I first came across this book, I was interested in what the research would teach us about our vast new digital world. Young people have a totally different relationship with computers and technology than their parents. So how we relate to each other and how we're sharing with each other has also been dramatically changing in the process. So my question really is, is technology hurting us? And as the focus of our society is turning more and more toward technology, and being outfitted with the newest and the latest gadgets, are we missing something along the way? Now, it seems obvious that young people are using technology differently than older people, so we're going to take a look at how technology is changing our relationships and what the future might bring. And since it definitely is here to stay, we do need to be aware of how we can remain open to all of this and how we can continue to relate to the younger generation. Because, of course, how we perceive it and how we judge it and judge the changes is really going to depend in large part on our own age and whether these devices have been a part of our lives or whether these changes have occurred after we were adults. So stay tuned as we talk about the positive and negative aspects of communicating and relating in the digital age with my guest, Robert Weiss. Of course, if you would like to join in, please call at 805-564-1290 or email your questions to me at drkim at drkimtaylorshow.com. So stay with me through the break. I'll be right back with my guest. I'm Dr. Kim, and you're listening to the Dr. Kim Taylor Show here at KZSB AM 1290. You are listening to Dr. Kim Taylor on KZSB AM 1290. My guest is Robert Weiss, and he's the author and psychotherapist, and he wrote a book called Closer Together, Further Apart. And it's all about the effect that all of this new technology and all of the information that we now have at our beck and call on the internet, how all of this is really affecting our relationships, how we relate to each other, and even parenting and how we're either working that out and or the problems that we're having. So I think it's a very important topic. And I know that for all of us, we are struggling with, is this really helpful? Is this hurting us in any way? What is this doing to the human brain? Or what is it doing to our children's brain to always be so plugged in and so connected to our phones or our laptops or computers? What I do know after reading his book is that he talked a lot about the fact that for young people, since they were kind of born with this, they are much more 
at ease with the whole concept of having this just be a part of every relationship or part of their daily life. Whereas those who were not born with this are the ones that are really struggling more about how does this fit in? Is it going to interfere with how we know how to relate to each other? Or is it going to be a very difficult process to try to bridge that generation gap? Robert, you really wrote this book to explore the problems that the digital world really appears to be having on our relationships. So what did you discover along the way with regard to the generation gap and how people are adapting? You know, I I guess I'm a 54-year-old man, and I'm a, a psychotherapist. I've been practicing for 20 years. So I, I um, you know, I've both seen my generational, the general generational changes that we've gone through in our lifetimes, and I've experienced what young people, you know, at the other end are dealing with when they come in for therapy. And also, I have a lot of clinician friends and therapist friends, so I kind of get, you know, the whole picture more or less. And I started out writing a book. I was positive, like everybody else. You know, tech was destroying our young people, and that all these digital devices were going to ruin their relationships, and they weren't going to understand how to build relationships or intimacy, and and that this was really a bad thing. And these were this would mirror books that other people have written, like Sherry Turkle, and there's another, you know, quite a bit of sort of um, uh, I would say academic viewpoints that tech is bad. Mm-hmm. And so I started writing this book, and then I realized I started looking at all the research and trying to find what I could, and I realized that. It really wasn't any. I mean, the generation that we're talking about is too young to really have thorough, a thorough understanding of how digital technology is going to affect them. And so then I started to wonder, well, why am I hearing all this chatter from people my age, you know, the baby boomers and the Gen Xers, about how, you know, our kids are just ruining their lives on devices and that whole generation is going to go to hell in a handbasket, all that stuff. And I, I started to realize that I'd heard this before. You know, Kim, it, it sounded to me like, I remember hearing when I was 17 about what sex, drugs, and rock and roll was going to do to my generation and what my parents said about the music we listened to and the new sexual mores that we had in the late 60s and 70s and the, and the recreational drugs that were brought about through the technologies of the time, not to mention the pill that brought about the sexualities of the time. And I started to realize that, you know, maybe, just maybe what we're seeing is another round of a generation gap, a profound, as profound one as we saw in the 60s and 70s, only instead of this one taking place on the street where people are marching with tie-dye and, you know, burning draft cards, this is one that's taking place in two different worlds. So, you know, if you're my age, if you're a 50, 60-year-old and you're online and you're basically scrapbooking on Facebook and chatting a little bit on LinkedIn for business, you know, you don't really understand the depth and meaning of that world to someone who's spent 50% of their waking hours in it, meaning your average 15 to 25 to 30-year-old. And uh, I started to realize that we had a very skewed view based on our generational experience of what younger people were going through and that maybe, in fact, we weren't right. You know, maybe when we sit down at the dinner table with a bunch of younger people and they're all tweeting and Twittering and Facebooking and looking at each other for a minute and then looking down, and then we older people at the other end of the table start clucking and saying, oh, those young people, they're so rude with their devices and they don't even look up to say hello. You know, maybe we're not right and they're not wrong. Maybe we're just experiencing the sort of uh, best scenario I can put it in is, you know, I don't know what you're wearing right now, Kim. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, if you're not wearing a hat and gloves and you're working, your grandmother would be very disappointed in you today. Mm-hmm. And so what was considered an absolute norm and a necessity in polite society in 1956, you know, is very, very different in 2015. And it may even include looking up and having a conversation with someone when they sit down at the table. You may just stay with your device for a while, and maybe that isn't rude as hard as it is for my generation to believe that so, might be possible. So your hope for this book was really to be a way to open up people's eyes and especially for those who view this internet and all of the tech as really the decline of mankind and so you're wanting to really push back to push back and to find a way to really close the generation gap that a lot of people are feeling right now, whether it's the young people or whether it's the old fogies like us. We're sure. all feeling that there's this huge gap, well, and we're really wanting to know 
how do we bridge it? Because this is here to stay. Right. Well, Kim, I appreciate it again. You know, I, I love the opportunity to talk about this because if I can bring young and older people together, you know, what a gift. And truly, when I've given talks about this, you know, and at length, you know, not just a few minutes, when people have read the book, they'll come up to me and they said, you know, I sat down and I played my granddaughter's video game for two hours with her. And I let her beat me every time, even though I probably could have won by the end. And by the time we were done playing, she wanted to go outside and take a walk with me, just like I'd asked her to do every day previously for the last three years. <laughs> In other words, if you join people where they are, this is a you know standard therapy rule. You know, right. join the client where right. they is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing for you know your kids. If you want them to go outside and play, maybe you should sit down and do what they're doing with them and be curious about it, engage in it, learn mm -hmm. from them. Give them that opportunity to say, hey, I really showed mom and dad a thing or two, and then take them outside, and they'll go willingly because you have not pushed them out of their world. You've joined them in their world. Okay, so that's definitely one way that we can do that. I think part of the fear is that for a lot of, whether it's parents and, and or grandparents, that they feel like the gap is so large that they don't know if they can ever catch up. Is there a way mm -hmm. or some steps that they can take to think <laughs> about what they might do that actually helps what you're talking about is to join with the younger generation. Yes, I mean, I, I, I mean, you and I both know there isn't a college student within a hundred miles of either one of us or anyone listening who wouldn't love to make fifteen dollars an hour to teach an older person how to get on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And I can't think of a better experience than sitting down with a younger person and understanding how they negotiate that world, what it means to them, um, how they explore it, what they learn from it, because this is their reality. You know, it was not. My reality, I grew up with face-to-face -face interactions being 100% of my experience, or, or maybe we picked up the phone, you know. But younger people experience digital face -face interactions 50% of the time. And then we look at them when they don't look up on their devices when we walk up, and we think, how rude, how awful, look at what's happening to these kids. And, you know, I can understand that. My parents said that about David Bowie, Led Zeppelin, and when I was playing Spin the Bottle. But that doesn't mean it's bad and wrong. It just means that it's different than the way we grew up. But does all of this technology really feed our need for having more social contact? And does the increased uh, connection online replace that development of what we know as the more intimate aspects of relating to somebody? Well, I'll give you an even larger view of it. I actually, I'm a social worker by training, and so I was actually worried in the 90s when all the websites came along and all of us sat down on our big butts and sat in front of a, a screen and were on one site or another site or another site, whether we were buying a plane ticket or trying to get that last, you know, piece of dishware for our set from eBay or whatever it is we were doing, you know. But what I loved seeing happen was social media. I loved when social media came along as a, as a therapist, as a professional, because I watched young people flock to connection. Mm -hmm. I watched them flock to people being connected by spiritual beliefs they have or hobbies they have or people they – or a class they're taking together. And, you know, it, it made me think of how deprived, in fact, we have been as people, um, you know, for hundreds of years of the communities that – are that humanity grew up in you know i mean most human beings up until the 18th century or so grew up in large communities where grandma was there and grandpa was there and auntie was there and your neighbor was there and there was always somebody around to talk to and there was always community i don't think anyone ever pictured we'd be living 19 stories up you know in a box with two children i mean that was just not sort of how we were supposed to end up i don't think by our biological upbringing so you know, I actually see the connectivity that I see, and I think younger people are more connected than we ever were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And well, while you might view their connections as being superficial or less meaningful, I, I always ask audiences this question, and I hope I have time for it with you, but I say to people, you know, how many of you, and of course I'm talking to audience of therapists in their over 40-something, and I'll say to them, you know, how many of you had a uh, pen pal back in the day? And, you know, maybe a third of them raise their hand. And I'll say, and, you know, how many of you talked to that pen pal back and forth? Talked meaning wrote on a postcard and put a stamp on it and put it in the post box. And it went somewhere, you know, a week later and they got it. Mm -hmm. How many of you wrote back and forth to your pen pal over a period of time? 
And in doing so, felt like you developed a relationship with that person. And uh, every one of those people raised their hands. Right. And so I'd say, hmm, that's interesting. So you can, even back, way back in the old analog days, develop a, a, feel, a felt relationship with someone that you begin to care about them and their family and understand their world, even though you've never met them. Well, guess what? That's what kids do every day, except they're doing it faster because they don't need to put a stamp on something and have somebody carry it across the world. They can just get online and meet someone. Right, and that's one of the pros of what is going on now because they really can have more access and they have a bigger group of people that they can certainly do this with. And, of course, that is the same thing. But part of, I'm sure, part of the fear is, is you know, how also does this hurt? Because when we see some of the very quick sexual encounters and or the cyberbullying, it can also have the downside. I also think that one of the greatest parts of it, though, which I would definitely call a pro, is that I think it's really broadened the world for a lot of people, and especially for kids. And with that bigger mm -hmm. picture, I think that it has really brought a lot of acceptance and tolerance for each other. And mm -hmm. I think that has been one, one of the greatest aspects And for of themselves. This. Yes. Yes. Right. Because they can find like people. Yeah. Yes. I'm a short kid and I don't know any other short kids and I'm 14 and I feel like no one's ever going to be my friend because I'm just as tall as I was in, in eighth grade or sixth grade or whatever. And now I find there's a whole, you know, world full of short kids who feel like I do. And they're maybe going to grow or not, but I'm not such a horrible, you know, I'm not alone. Well, and that kind of empathic connection that's available, even yeah. without having to run to your parents or a counselor and say, could someone let me in, is a wonderful thing. Yeah, and there were days when I was in the sixth grade and I was the tallest one in the whole school. <laughs> I definitely could have used someone else there that was actually in the tall group. That would have been nice, too. <laughs> but but I, I just want to say briefly, I, I'm not saying, and it's really important to say, I'm not saying the Internet is a panacea, mm -hmm. that, for, that everything is going to be wonderful. We're going to have a glorious future. We're going to have problems. We already have them. You know, we have people with addiction problems. We have people with spending problems. We have people with gambling problems. We have people with sexual problems. And they're all getting acted out on the Internet. But my guess is that these are mostly people who would have acted out problems in the world um, had they not had an Internet. You know, they would have acted them out in real time, or they would have had different problems. But uh, I don't – my concern is sort of the overall viewpoint that, like, uh, you know, our world is going to be ruined mm -hmm. because all of our kids are going to become narcissistic, compulsive online gamers <laughs> or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that what the Internet is doing is it's representing the best and the worst of us. And, uh, you know, most of us will be just fine as we've always been. And then there will be people who come along and help some people who struggle. And then some people will not do so well because of that world. And that may be our evolution. Mm-hmm. Okay, we are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I'd actually like to get into how has all of this affected parenting and what can parents actually do to deal with some of those changes. So I'll be right back. Uh, my guest is Robert Weiss. He's uh, is the author of the book Closer Together, Further Apart. I'm Dr. Kim Taylor, and you're listening to The Dr. Kim Taylor Show. We'll be right back. You are listening to Dr. Kim Taylor on KZSB AM 1290. If you are just joining me, I'm here with Robert Weiss, the author and psychotherapist, as well as an international speaker. And we are talking about the importance of understanding the impact of the digital age and how it does affect our lives and our relationships. His book is titled Closer Together, Further Apart. So in this book, Robert, you talk about this gulf that does separate the generations, but that you are saying that it is not insurmountable and that we can bridge this gap. So let's first talk about parenting. How has this affected parenting and what can parents do to try to bridge this gap? Well, I, I, uh, this is, I mean, obviously in a short time we have, we can't go over everything, but I think there are certain things that parents need to be pretty cognizant of. You know, I think every parent should be aware that their children are getting sex education from the pornography industry. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, there reason, recently were some attempts to do research studies on uh, young males, 15, 16, 17 years old, and uh, who were viewing Internet pornography. And the problem with the research was we could not find any young males between 15 and 18 who were not viewing Internet pornography in order to do a sample study. So 
my point is is that um, like it or not, good or bad, right or wrong, your kids are looking at porn. And so the question is, you know, how do you handle that? And this is probably the biggest issue that I, you know, come as a therapist, come up with with parents. And, you know, what I would say is for post-pubescent teens, you know, kids who are 14, 15, 16, you know, it's really about, number one, making sure they understand sexuality, re- relationships, intimacy, and and that they understand that what they're seeing online when they see pornography, that's entertainment. That's a that's a meant uh, for adults to enjoy, like they might have a glass of wine or go to a casino. It's not how life is. They need to understand that what they're seeing in pornography is not necessarily the kind of sexuality that would occur between two people who care about each other or two people who have been together for a period of time, or even that that kind of sexuality would bring two people together. So, you know, like it or not, America, American parents need to be talking to their kids about sex and not so much about what parts work what way or what, you know, diseases might come, but more about what sex means and, and what does the physical act mean in terms of relationship and caring and closeness and, and ultimately intimacy. Um, Otherwise, they're only going to get their education from porn. Um, and then there's a different message, Kim, that we you know, you know need to give to parents who are dealing with kids who are prepubescent or you know uh, under 13 or 14. You have in your book a lot of guidelines about some kind of privacy locks to put on, and yes. also some of these sites that the younger kids do not actually have um, access to. But I think the main part is, as parents these days, we have to educate that we have to have those talks that make us so uncomfortable and make yes. our toes curl. We still have to have those more than ever because they are finding out about this information. They do now have access, not just within your home, but every other home they walk into or anybody else's yes yes and if they're not looking at it because they have a privacy lock on their phone they're certainly looking on their friends phones who parents haven't done this yet so you're saying the best thing we can do is just talk and talk and keep talking and that means parents also have to check out some of these sites and see what's actually available to so that they know how to handle it yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say simply talking is enough. I, I think talking is a good response to the pornography. Is helping them understand like what the meaning of pornography is. You know, because they're going to see it. So you might as well tell them it's entertainment, not real life, so they get to, to figure that one out. But, but I would absolutely put blocking software, um, meaning kids cannot access that kind of material in, in, in for a pre pubescent child. And you can do this on a phone. You can do this on a on a pad, you can do this on any kind of device or device or computer. You can put blocking software that simply will completely not allow them access to pornographic material. And then, you know, with a post team or, or, or someone who's a little older, what I would probably do is use tracking software. And what that does is it tells you where they have gone on the Internet. Because I think, you know, you, and I think you'd agree, you know, younger kids, you really need to watch out for them. They don't always know where they might end up. And so we want to keep them out of places that could be confusing to them or hurtful to them. But with older children who are going to resent the heck out of you watching their every move, out of your uh, uh, blocking them from things, at least if you observe where they're going online, um, they're, you're forcing them to take responsibility, be accountable for where they go. And those kind of blockers and filters are all available uh, well, on my uh, through my website or pretty much any website you can look at, okay. look up parental blocks and filters. Okay, I uh, do have an email that that came in, but just because of time and I want to get to a few things, I'm just going to uh, summarize it. But they are asking they they have two kids, seven and thirteen, and they're talking about that they understand that there is a you know gap, but that what can they do as far as just the rules that they should have perhaps around the dinner table or around times that it's family time or family meetings or being in the car is it okay to really set limits about the use of all of these devices i i I absolutely think it's an imperative to set limits and there's nothing wrong with setting limits um it's kind of like i think it's a broader issue it's like um you know, I remember when I was growing up, you know, the big deal was the TV, and kids are watching too much TV, and parents were using the TV as babysitters, and you know, now we hear about it being our devices. But, you know, whatever rules you would set with your kids around whatever distractions there might be, in other words, when we're sitting at dinner, we don't have distractions, it's just us, or when we're in the car, whatever, you know, whatever your environment is, or, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with saying you don't have access to that until your homework is done, until your chores are done. Um, you know, we're already trying to train little adults here. But, um, 
But what I am saying also is that, you know, if you walk in the room on a Saturday afternoon when they've been doing great and they're spending yet a third hour on the Internet and you think, God, won't that kid just go outside and play? But you mm-hmm. might need to take a deep breath and walk the other way because they're just being kids doing what kids are doing today. So what are the changes that this very fast-paced, constant input, that all of this uh, connection, what is it doing to the human brain and, mm. es- and especially to our children? That is such a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. So, you know, for us older, or let's say us analog people, you know, who grew up in a pre-digital generation, and I grew up playing with blocks and trains, not with anything that moved faster than that. So, um, you know, for us, I think what is to come and what we're dealing with is overwhelm, you know. I mean, hyper-stimulation, the fact that I would get 40 messages from someone during the day or 75 or 100 at work, and then answer them all, and then come home to another 40 or 50, and then have to think, well, do I work? Because it's after 5, and I am home, but the kids are, you know, that's a hyper, and not to mention, you know, all the information and um, opportunities and shopping, all the stuff that's online, it's overwhelming to us. You know, we didn't grow up with that much choice. And I think going along as there becomes more choice and it becomes more sophisticated, we will be more overwhelmed, and the tendency of older people will be to blame our young. Um, younger people, not so much, you know, I think the, er- well, what we're seeing is the earlier that you are, uh, digitally engaged. And by the way, kids are getting iPads and devices at two now, you know, I don't know. Have you seen this mm-hmm. Dr-, Dr. Taylor where I see a kid on an airplane who literally cannot speak English. I know that they do not have how to form words yet, but they are playing games on the pad quickly too. And their fingers are moving. And, and now they're communicating because apparently there's been some studies that they will send emoji or, you know, facial images like smiles and kisses mm-hmm. to people through their paths so they know they're actually communicating with people that aren't there, even though they can't form a sentence. So do you ask me, will their brains be different than ours? You betcha. They're going to be able to move from subject to subject, from interest area to interest area so much faster than we will. I, I don't know if they'll be able to multitask, but they're going to be able to move very quickly from complete focus on one task to complete, sorry, to complete focus on another without, getting in, without the thoughts that we have in the way of getting there. They're going to be different people than we are. Um, they'll have, life will have different meaning. Their relationships will be different. Um, we're already seeing that. I mean, I, someone actually asked me to sign my signature today, and I thought, when was the last time I actually picked up a pen and wrote anything down, you know? Mm-hmm. And didn't we spend, I don't know, I think I spent the first 40 years of my life doing nothing but writing things, and I can't remember the last time I picked up a pen. So, you know, think of a kid who's never even seen a pen, <laughs> yeah. and you'll begin to get the idea. Well, I think the major uh, concern for most people is that, is all of this going to really help us or hurt us in our intimate relationships and the, in all of the interactions that we have with with each other. What would you really say about that portion of it? Um, I think it helps those who who are people who would do well with a device like the Internet, and I think it doesn't help people who wouldn't. And I know that sounds kind of arbitrary or confusing, but it's true. You know, if I'm someone who... You know, can quickly pick up the language, the style, the the way of engaging that the Internet and various social media provide. If I am comfortable communicating myself through text and imagery, you know, and carrying on some kind of banter that way, I might well get a date or get myself laid, you know, or whatever. But if I'm, uh, you know, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about me, I'm married, (laughs) I'm just saying. Um, But if... But if, you know, I'm not comfortable in that world and I don't like that world and I avoid that world or I don't know how to use that world, then I may be in a disadvantage for uh, accessing connection, relationship, and intimacy. Because, you know, here's what's, I think, the most important thing I want to say to everybody out there who is concerned about how digital technology has so overwhelmingly changed our lives and continues to. And what I'm going to say isn't going to make anyone happy, but it doesn't matter. It's what is. The train has left the station. We are now, as the president said, one-fifth of the way into the 21st century. And we are just like we're not riding horses and buggies and wearing tall hats anymore. We're also no longer writing letters or making sure that everyone's looking at each other around the dinner table. Sometimes things change, and they change in ways that we're not comfortable. But that doesn't necessarily mean that change is bad. What I think, Kim, is that we're experiencing human evolution in real time, 
we're experiencing evolution in terms of our relationship to technology. Mm -hmm. So the people who are more skilled at it or who who are better at building relationships and finding ways to make babies through technology, they will be our future. And those who struggle with connection and relationship and maybe are satisfied enough with a computer and don't desire a human connection, Mm -hmm. uh, they won't reproduce. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so whereas some of the older uh, generation may feel that something might be uh, missing. Just, well, it is missing. Well, I mean, it is because sure. it isn't what we grew up with. Right? right. But I think the point of what you're saying is that there is... It's not necessarily bad. Right, and there is something good about both perspectives and that this is here to stay. It's not going to go away. So we really do need to move forward and to evolve consciously around all of this so that yes, we can learn, have, grow, embrace. Right, and, and, and to be able to do that with compassion for each other within this process. Well, we're never going to be, I mean, when I wrote this book, I didn't mean to vilify my own generation. You know, <laughs> I understand that I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to keep up. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to figure all those things out. It's going to overwhelm me. I feel that way every day, and I know many, many people do. Mm -hmm. You know, but that doesn't mean that we should turn it into bad. It's just not what we're used to. That's right, and it's just different. It's not bad. All right, Robert, thank you very much for being with us. Do you have a contact number and or site that people can reach you? Yeah, my name is Robert Weiss. So uh, R-O-B-E-R-T-W-E-I-S-S, and uh, I am an MSW, that means I have a Master's in Social Work, so my email address is robertweissmsw.com, and you'll find all the information about blockers and filters and things parents should and shouldn't think about and a lot of other issues related to mental health and addiction related to the Internet on my site. Yes, and this is a great book. I think that every parent probably should read this book, and just for the resources at the back of the book would also just be of great value. Oh, hey, one more thing, Kim. Yes. There's a great movie called, which very few people saw, I think, called Men, Women, and Children. And Jason Reitman was the director, and it's all about the generational confusion between what kids are dealing with online and what their parents are dealing with online. It's a very funny movie, very useful, and I highly recommend taking a look at it. It's called Men, Women, and Children. Okay, great. Robert Weiss, thank you very much for being here. I'm Dr. Kim Taylor, and I'll be right back after this break for some closing comments. You are listening to Dr. Kim Taylor on KZSB AM 1290. So we're at the end of our program, and I want to thank you for joining me. If you would like more information about Robert Weiss or his book, Closer Together, Further Apart, it's about the effect of technology and the Internet on parenting, work, and our relationships, you can certainly just go to my website for all of the information. It's at drkimtaylorshow.com. You can also find my past shows by going to iTunes and to download the free weekly podcast, or you can find them now on my YouTube channel. Just go to my website website for all of the links, again, at drkimtaylorshow.com. So, of course, I'd love to hear from you. Send in your questions or emails at drkim at drkimtaylorshow.com. I definitely want to thank Mark Giles, my engineer, helped me and saved me a little bit here this morning as we had a late guest. So be well until next week when I will be back here live at 5, as I am every Thursday. I'm Dr. Kim Taylor, and until then, remember... Nobody else has to change in order for you to feel better. And remember, we're always making choices, so choose wisely and choose consciously. Until next time, take care.